What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Eye Test. John is moving in with his girlfriend, so I will be your host tonight. And I am joined by Paul Orlando, my co-host. And today we are going to be talking sleeper picks that you need to be targeting in your fantasy drafts. But specifically in rounds 4 through 11. As always, don't forget to subscribe to us on all your social media platforms. But enough of that. Let's just get into the sleeper picks. Me and Paul are going to be rotating picks, so it's going to be one pick per round. Paul, why don't you start us off with round four? Who is the sleeper that you are targeting in round four? Sure. So let me just pull up my mock draft board real quick. So I have Joe Mixon running back for the Bengals, a previous first round pick last year, if I believe. Maybe second, but he Maybe was definitely, second. He was definitely yeah, so a first round fallen, pick. I'm sorry. I said he was definitely a first round pick in maybe two years ago, but I think he may have fallen to maybe the second round last year, but he's a little bit of a fall for grace from him. Yeah. So he's landing in the fourth round and I honestly think this is a perfect spot to grab him. He's one of those guys that has been in the league long enough where we don't really talk about him too much because we kind of know what he's about. We know what he's capable of, but he did get his legal issues sorted out. He is the workhorse back in a very good offense who has shown the capability of having receiving upside. So anytime you can get a player like that in the fourth round, I think it is a must grab. The Bengals did trade or release Samaj P. Ryan. They he was a free agent, so they let him walk and then he signed with the Broncos. Okay, so regardless, the receiving vulture in Samaji P. Ryan is no longer on the Bengals. He's dealing with a running back room of Chase Brown, who's just happy that he made the team. Let's be honest. Who even is that? Yeah, he's like a rookie (laughs) or something. He's from like he's from Canada, actually. I didn't know that until I did research today. He's Canadian born. So international. Yeah. Good for you, Canada. (laughs) Um, but Joe Mixon last year, he did finish as the RB 13, but he did have that big 55 point game. If you remember that really inflated his stats. Yep. Yep. But still Joe Mixon has finished as a top back for most of his career. When he's healthy, he is a very serviceable volume, heavy running back. So anytime you can get someone to be your RB2 or even your RB1 when you do zero running back strategy in the fourth round, there's no better candidate than Joe Mixon. Like I said, really good offense, improved offensive line, receiving upside, and he's virtually fighting no one for opportunities. So I have Joe Mixon here as our fourth round sleeper, even though he's a veteran, he's not really a boomer bust candidate, but he's just someone we don't really talk about too often. Yeah, I think a lot of people were let down when he was being drafted in the first and second round and never really lived up to expectations at that ADP. But now you're pretty much drafting him at his floor instead of his ceiling, which is what you pretty much want to do. So he's a very good value play in the fourth round. And I know someone in our fantasy league who actually drafted him in the third round towards the end. So there are people that are higher on him than his ADP indicates. But Joe Mixon... Very good pick in the fourth round. Moving on to the fifth round, this is a guy that I was a little skeptical about, and I still don't think he's a sure thing by any means, but given the players that are being drafted in his range, I think he has the highest upside from the players in that range, and that's Christian Watson. Uh, I haven't caught a lot of preseason football so far, but I have seen a lot of highlights from the Packers. And the Packers look pretty good, a lot better than I thought they were going to. And that Packers offensive line is amazing. I One of the games, I'm pretty sure Jordan Love dropped back 18 times. Again, I'm not sure if it was the first or second team defense, but he wasn't pressured at all in 18 dropbacks. That Packers offensive line is legit, and that's making Jordan Love's life easier and also going to make Christian Watson's life easier as well. He's the wide receiver one on the Packers. I know Romeo Dobbs may have something to say about that, but Christian Watson obviously has way more upside than Dobbs does. He has had a pretty good year in his rookie year. He had seven touchdowns or something like that. Like He was very efficient for the amount of volume that he got. So if we're expecting more volume this season, which I think that's an easy assumption because – Second second year wide receiver coming off a so-so rookie year. But 
he's going to be much better this season. And as long as you believe in Jordan Love and believe in the upside of Christian Watson, then I think he's a pretty good pick in this range. There's no real guaranteed guys in this range. So draft for upside in this range. And that's why I would go with Christian Watson in the fifth as my sleeper pick. I think Christian Watson doing a little foreshadowing to next week's episode where we do our preseason fantasy awards. I think Christian Watson would have won waiver wire warrior award yeah. last year. He was someone that just completely started burning rubber in the second half. I mean, he was scoring a touchdown a game. They all seem to be on deep balls. He is believe it or not, Bob, the most experienced receiver on this Packers roster. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that he is. I think you're right. Him and Dobbs are going into their second year. They drafted Jaden Reed, who's a rookie, and they also drafted that tight end Musgrave as well. So, yeah, him and Dobbs are like second-year wide receivers are like the vets of the Packers wide yeah. receiving core. Yeah, but Watson, I think, clearly has the edge over Dubs. Dubs, Dubs, Dobbs, 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 Dobbs. Dobbs. <laughs> <laughs> so Christian Watson, I think, clearly has the edge here. I love Watson for his upside if he can – be anything like he was in the second half of last year and if Jordan Love who looks capable he looks very capable I will say so it's going to be really exciting to see what comes out of Green Bay this offseason or this regular season sometimes it's tough to like change your tune like a lot of people are hesitant to like flip-flop pretty much which is what I've done because I wasn't high on him at all but I've seen enough where I think it's going to warrant at least that fifth round ADP. And if he, you know, even mildly hits his ceiling, you're talking about a guy that could potentially be a high end wide receiver too. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. All right. So coming into the sixth round, I have someone who we kind of shook our heads at last year when the Jaguars gave him that big money contract. And it turned out the guy was pretty good at football. And so my six round sleeper is Christian Kirk. He is coming in this Jaguars offense. He led the team in receiving last year. They now have Calvin Ridley, which is why I think Christian Kirk has fallen some out of the wide receiver one, even high end wide receiver two territory and found himself in the sixth round. But Bob, I am comparing him to kind of the DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett situation here where last year DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, finished as like the wide receiver 14 and the wide receiver 15 or the 15 and 16. They finished like right around each other's value. Yeah. But even in this year, DK Metcalf went in the third round of our league and Christian Kirk went in the six and similar Tyler Lockett went in the six and similar Calvin Ridley went in the third round in our league and yeah. Christian Kirk went in the six. Yeah. So am I crazy to think that the wide receiver 11 from last year is going to fall that far from grace just because Calvin Ridley, who has not played football in two years, joins the squad? I don't think you're crazy at all. I actually think Kirk is one of the best values of in all of fantasy football right now for all the reasons you said. I expect Calvin Ridley to be good, but Trevor Lawrence is still going to be passing a lot. And his wide receiver, two last season in Zay Jones still finished as – he was either the wide receiver 24 or the wide receiver 25. He was basically a wide receiver too. And Christian Kirk, I think is better than Zay Jones. So it would not surprise me at all. If Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk finish as top 20 wide receivers, given that offense is going to be really good. Yeah. And like you said, the value, I mean, you can get Christian Kirk three rounds after Calvin Ridley for someone who can put up very similar numbers. So if you, are torn on what to do in the sixth round and you see Christian Kirk there, I highly recommend just make it easy. Don't overthink it. Just smack that draft button. Yeah. Again. And there's guys in his range, like Michael Pittman jr. Who is going to have Anthony Richardson throwing to him this season. And I don't expect Anthony Richardson to be passing like Tom Brady or anything like that. It's going to be rough for him this year. Mike Williams, who is injury prone. And although he has shown a lot of promise when he is healthy, Not a guy I'd rather, I'd just rather have Kirk over him, you know, but that's a good pick. And I totally expect him to perform like he did last year. Now, moving on to round seven, this is a guy that I guess when he, this, you'll, you'll know this, Paul, you traded for him or you traded him 
or no, you did. You traded for him a day after our draft a few years ago for, oh, who was it for? <laughs> you, you were so high on him as a rookie. Can you guess oh, who it is? <laughs> I know exactly who it is. I traded, <laughs> I traded for him. So I traded Dalvin Cook for yeah. Amari Cooper and David Montgomery. Yeah. Now we won't revisit that too much, but let's just say that was the year that Dalvin Cook was the RB2 overall. Yeah. So stupid decision on my part. <laughs> but nevertheless, David Montgomery, I think, is a smash at his ADP in the seventh round this season. He's easily going to be on the best offense he's been in in his entire career. That Detroit offensive line is legit. We know Detroit wants to use their running backs. They wanted to use DeAndre Swift last year, but for some reason he was just in the doghouse. And they gave Montgomery a pretty big contract for a running back. Although they brought in Jameer Gibbs, we know they're going to use Montgomery as well. He didn't play at all in the preseason, which I think should tell you a lot about how much they're going to use him. This is probably going to be 50-50. And Again, I think this is another example where these two running backs could finish in the top 24. And you have Gibbs with his ADP in the third round. Why not just wait four more rounds for a guy like Montgomery, who is likely going to get the really high-value touches in the red zone? Yeah. No, I think David Montgomery, they're looking at David Montgomery to fill that Jamal Williams role from last year. Yeah. Now, I don't expect David Montgomery to set another Lions season record no, in rushing no. touchdowns. But like you said, Bob, they brought him in for a reason and gave him a pretty lengthy and rich contract for him to come and run the football. Jameer Gibbs, I think, is still a rookie. I expect more of a balanced attack out of this surprisingly mm -hmm. awesome Lions offense. At least we expect it to be pretty awesome. So I love David Montgomery here in the later rounds, especially if you did the zero running back strategy or if you, he's like the perfect bench running back. He's like. I would, if you could get him as your RB2 in the seventh round, I would be ecstatic. And that's why I'm so upset that I missed on him by two picks. I know. In you were our so draft. close. You so were so close. close. I have him in literally so many other leagues. I think I have him in at least two of my other leagues. I'm very high on him this year. And it's just too much of a value to pass up. You know, I, and he also could do it all. He could catch passes and he could run. So, you got to if you are looking for a running back in the seventh round, whether it's at the beginning of the seventh round or at the end of the seventh round, I think David Montgomery is a no brainer there. Yeah, I completely agree. I think David Montgomery is going to have a very serviceable fantasy season this year. But moving on to the eighth round. So I could talk about Aaron Rodgers here. I could talk about Deshaun Watson. I know those are the two big quarterbacks that are being targeted, but I'm not going to go that route, Bob. I'm going to talk about a wide receiver, too, who has had a 1,000-yard season every year besides his rookie year and when he was hurt and last year. And that's because he was on the Texans. And that's Brandon Cooks. Brandon you can Cook. get, yeah, you can get Brandon Cooks in the eighth round, the newly acquired wide receiver two for the Dallas Cowboys. And even though Cooks has been in the league for nine years, do you know how old he is, Bob? 29. He's 29 years old. <laughs> he is not even 30 yet. Going on to his ninth year, he's in a very pass-happy offense with the best quarterback that he's played with since probably Brady. I mean, he had Goff in L.A., uh, and then he had Drew Brees in New Orleans, too, but he went to the pats after new orleans yeah 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 yeah. and then he went to the rams with goff and then he went to houston so he's brandon cooks here yeah he's been he's been passed around a lot which i don't know if that's like a personality issue but I fantasy don't owners it's don't care weird. about that just perform on the field for me yeah and so he's had a thousand yards every year of his career they are predicting him to be the second on the team in receiving obviously next to cd lamb and I'm not saying that CeeDee Lamb's numbers are going to tank. I actually expect CeeDee Lamb to have another great year because he actually has a competent wide receiver two lining up on the outside with him and Brandon Cooks. So I can see Brandon Cooks being a very, very serviceable eighth-round player. I would feel comfortable putting him in my flex, and I would feel comfortable even putting him at wide receiver two if things were 
to happen on your roster, say you drafted Jerry Judy and he might miss the first couple of weeks, you can still compete for the first you know few games of the season with Brandon Cooks at your wide receiver too. So to have him in the eighth round as either a bench stash or like a start in a pinch flex, I think it's a great situation to be in. Yeah, I I like Cooks, especially at a, in the eighth round, but I'm not as optimistic as you are given that Michael Gallup is still there, even though there have been trade rumors, supposedly. But if Michael Gallup comes back this season and is healthy and ready to go, because he obviously wasn't last season coming off a torn ACL, I think that's where the situation gets a little dicey. And it's real like, obviously, the Cowboys needed to bring another wide receiver in because after CeeDee Lamb, it was like Noah Brown, you know, yeah. and Gallup wasn't himself. It was a disaster last year for their wide receiving core. So they definitely needed depth. I'm just kind of questioning whether Brandon Cooks, who's obviously the more seasoned wide receiver than Michael Gallup, a more proven. I'm just wondering if the volume is going to be there for him to actually produce and say your wide receiver two slot flex play different story. But if you're putting him in the wide receiver two, I wouldn't feel too good about that. Maybe. And like a spot start or something like that, but I don't, I wouldn't want to be relying on him all season long as a wide receiver too. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can totally get behind that. And like you said, it, it's the eighth round. So you did not, hopefully you did not draft him to be your wide receiver too in the eighth no. round. <laughs> so, but if you have to, if you absolutely have to, I would expect Cooks to get maybe six to eight targets a game. And it's just a matter of whether he can turn them into a touchdown or whether he can turn one into like a decently long one. But still, I think a 10 point floor for Brandon Cooks um, is something you can be happy with in the eighth round. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think he has to prove um, he has something to prove also coming from the Texans. I don't know if it's been documented or not, but he like obviously wasn't happy there. I don't know if he really forced his way out or not, but I know there's definitely some people chirping that he's washed and he doesn't have it anymore. So maybe there will be that little extra kick for him to perform this yeah. season. I think so, he definitely threw a little temper tantrum last year. I mean, I would too. I mean, yeah. Even, he did okay. I mean, not last season, but while he was with the Texans, given the situation, he still performs pretty well. But obviously last season, it just didn't work out. But yeah. see how it goes with Brandon Cooks. Now let's move on to another. We're moving on to round nine. Switching positions here from a wide receiver to a running back. And obviously in round nine, you're not talking about guys that are for the most part, RB1s on their own team. You're talking guys that are RB2s. So you're not really expecting, you know, 15-point games. You're expecting floors and, like, you're talking handcuffs and players like that. And this guy is probably the best handcuff you could get in the NFL. And that is A.J. Dillon. A.J. Dillon, the past two seasons, has actually finished as a high – no, excuse me, as a low RB2. And when he's – healthy he actually plays nearly 50 percent of the snap so it's pretty much an even split with him between aaron jones and himself obviously aaron jones has a much higher ceiling is the better all-around back catches passes and is more explosive and all that but if you can get a guy that plays 50 percent of the snaps consistently in the ninth round and who is will easily slide into an RB2 slot if Aaron Jones got hurt. I think it's, an again, another guy that you should easily take and shouldn't even think about. The past two seasons, he's had seven touchdowns apiece, and this is just a consistent player that you want to have. You know, he'll probably start out on your bench, but he could easily make his way into the flex conversation. And like I said, if Aaron Jones got hurt, he's a guy that's in one of your running back slots immediately. Yeah. And A.J. Dillon, Aaron Jones, they kind of form sort of this where Aaron Jones is the PPR guy mm -hmm. and Aaron Jones is the guy who has the receiving upside. But Dillon is the bruiser. So like you said, seven touchdowns a year, that's huge. And especially if you catch A.J. Dillon on an A.J. Dillon game, you could be riding him for 20 plus points that week. Yeah, yeah. Didn't really show much of a ceiling last season, but we know he's had some ceiling games before. Again, you're not drafting for a guy that's going to be putting up a ton of points. You're drafting more for like opportunity and just depth. But 
AJ Dillon is one of the better players you could draft in the later rounds. Yeah. Yeah. And once we kind of hit after the eighth round, you're kind of just throwing, yeah. throwing darts at the wall and just seeing what sticks. So AJ Dillon is a calculated, I don't want to say risk, but like a calculated dart throw. Yeah. And you, again, it's, it's extremely calculated because you know, he's going to be getting the ball. Like it's a 50, 50 split. You know what I mean? Like we were talking last season, how it's such a headache dealing with, the Packers coaching staff and their running backs. Cause you just never know who's going to really get the ball and get those high value touches. You know, obviously everyone would rather have Aaron Jones, but AJ Dillon has showed a ton of potential over the years. Yeah. Sorry. I was plugging my computer in cause it was about All to die. Good. All good. Let's move on to round 10. Yeah. So round 10, I want, I wanted to talk about Khalil Herbert here, but, I did cover him a lot in our shorts, so be sure to check out our page and check out all of our shorts where I go in-depth on Khalil Herbert and why I think he's going to be a pretty solid, serviceable option here. So I'm going to take this time to talk about Cortland Sutton, and a lot of this has to do with, if you've seen our ticker, I don't know where it is currently, but Jerry Judy did get carted off. I hate saying that word. He got carted off the field at practice with a hamstring injury. Now, good news is if you're a Jerry Judy owner like myself, they are optimistic that he will be back sooner rather than later. But as we all know, these hamstring injuries can linger, and I'm sure the Broncos are going to take their time getting Judy back on the field, make sure he's healthy. So in the 10th round, grabbing Cortland Sutton, who a lot, a lot of people, especially fantasy experts, were taking – either last year or two years ago in like the third or fourth round, because they just yeah. expected him to have a complete breakout. You're getting him now in the 10th, 10th round. He is clearly bench depth last year for the Broncos was just absolutely abysmal. It was something where I wouldn't even just throw out the tape. Like, don't even look at it. You're just going to hurt yourself and hurt others watching it. It was that bad. They now have Sean Payton coming in. They now have some new morale around the team. You're hoping to get, at least half of what you expected out of Russell Wilson. Dude, you and hope so, man. Yeah. You hope so. It's, Otherwise, it's going to be a big problem in Denver. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be really 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 tough in Denver. But Sean Payton, if there's anybody on this planet that's not named Andy Reid that I think can help Russell Wilson at least meet some of that expectation that they brought him in for, it's going to be Sean Payton. So Cortland Sutton, the 10th, it's sort of like one of those why not things. It's still a little, not a little. I think it's way too early to go after a Marvin Mims where Cortland Sutton has shown flashes. He's proven that he is a capable wide receiver in this league. And so getting him in the 10th with Jerry Judy sidelined, Sutton could just have a great first couple of games. And now Sutton is like the wide receiver two on this team when Judy comes back instead of Marvin Mims, instead of you know, whoever else they have out there. I still am very high on Judy. Don't get me wrong. I think they drafted Jerry Judy, and I think he runs some excellent routes. But Cortland Sutton is an excellent, excellent dart throw in the 10th round, especially with news of Jerry Judy in the hamstring. Yeah, I again, you're not drafting studs in the 10th round. But if you haven't drafted yet, if then you know Jerry Judy is going to miss, you know, I'm not sure how many games, but four games. So almost a quarter of the season, maybe something like that. So you're talking about a wide, probably the wide receiver one on the Broncos to start the season. I know everyone's has the rookie fever with Marvin Mims, but we still have to see it. I'm not saying don't draft Marvin Mims, but we know Cortland Sutton has been there. And when he's healthy, he has actually been decent. You know, not a whole lot to show for it in his fantasy career, but he's been okay. And that's a guy I would be more than happy drafting in the 10th round as opposed to taking a complete dart throw in Marvin Mims maybe later, but we just don't know what he's going to be yet, you know? And once Jerry Judy comes back, Marvin Mims is likely sliding back into that wide receiver three role. So I'd rather just have Cortland Sutton on my bench personally. Yeah. And like I said, hopefully Judy comes. They're not going to rush him back. I mean, as a Judy owner, I pray that he's back for week one. I doubt it. I probably wouldn't even start him for week one, even if he's active. So Cortland Sutton is like, like I said, that calculated dart throw where it's like, why not? You just never know, especially with Sean Payton. Yeah. 
Speaking of calculated dart throws, we are moving on to our last round, and that is round 11. And you want to talk about a dart throw? This guy is an absolute dart throw because he is 100% always injured. Always. Every single year, he's always getting hurt. But when he plays, he is very good. And he just performs when he's on the field, even though he's pro- he's definitely the RB2 on his own team. And that's Elijah Mitchell. Elijah Mitchell, I know he didn't play much last season, but he averaged over six yards a carry last season. And that was even when, you know, CMC was there for, for, for a couple games. I forget when Mitchell exactly got injured, but they played a couple games together. And Elijah Mitchell was still utilized when CMC was there. So if you're talking about a guy that you just want to have throw a complete dart there as a handcuff to CMC or a guy that could really step in and be very, very good. If God forbid CMC got hurt, Elijah Mitchell is the guy. And as we all know, Kyle Shanahan is completely unpredictable with how he utilizes his offense. He has a history of just benching guys randomly. Now that obviously won't happen with CMC, but it wouldn't shock me at all. If Elijah Mitchell has more, has a, a larger share of this offense than a lot of people think while he's healthy and on the field. And that's the biggest question. And that's why you're able to get him in round 11, but a guy that has so much upside, if CMC was to get hurt and may might be able to have some flex appeal if he could actually stay healthy this year. Yeah. And I think Eliza Mitchell was the most coveted. I'm getting, I keep getting my years mixed up. Was it last year? Before CMC, he was like the most coveted waiver wire ad after week one. Like, maybe was it two years ago? He was a high, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he was a high draft pick, you know, within the past like two years. And then he just did, does what he does. He gets hurt. And then, yeah. you know, now you find him back in the 11th round. But he has yeah. a lot of talent. He's got a plethora of talent. And we've seen it in those burst games. I'm going to pull up his stats right now. But he is certainly the RB2 on this backfield. Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson went down to Miami to join their buddy, Mike McDaniel. So this 49ers backfield is just speed, 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 speed. And with Elijah Mitchell, in his rookie year, he finished as the RB26. So just outside of that RB2 conversation, he almost uh, got 1,000 yards. And like you said, if he can stay healthy... And if God forbid, I don't wish anything on Christian McCaffrey, but if CMC were to go down, I mean, this guy is immediately fired into your RB2, if not RB1 yeah. role. Dude, if he's healthy and CMC goes down, he, you everyone knows how Kyle Shanahan runs his offense. He's going to run the ball a lot. So pretty much any running back that slides into that role is going to perform at, at the absolute floor an RB2 level, just the way the offense is ran. Yeah. Shanahan is a genius. I will give him that. So Elijah Mitchell, not a guy that you really want to rely on, but a guy that is definitely worth taking in round 11, given that his talent is just through the roof when he's on the field. And he may surprise actually this season. Any honorable mentions for you, Paul, before we close it out? Hmm. Honorable mentions, I would say just any rookie running back that you personally like. If it's like the 12th, 13th, 14th round and you really like Tank Bigsby or you really like Roshan Johnson, throw a dart at them because you just never know. We've obviously seen with the whole contract dispute with everything going on in the NFL with the running back position, newer seems to be better. Coaches and organizations like these rookie running backs that they can get for three, four years and not have to pay. So throw some dart throws at those guys. Yeah. In that spirit, I will say a guy that uh, I really like after the preseason who probably won't have a lot of value in redraft leagues, but for dynasty is Ty J Spears. That guy looks like the real deal. And with Derrick Henry getting older, he looks like a guy that could easily step in to the Titans RB one role and just immediately perform so that's a guy to keep your eye on if we're you know talking dynasty now but be that as it may so that's all that we have for you guys today 
As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us on all your social media platforms. We will see you next week with our Fantasy Awards episode. And that's what we're going to be doing all season long. So check out the first episode and we will see you guys next week.